So, welcome to the next edition of the Rare Business Podcast. With me today, I have Carl Chapman from Riverview Law. Hi, Carl. Hi, how are you? I'm very well, thank you. So, Carl, um, diving straight in, tell us a bit about yourself. Uh, right, well... And um, about you married... and about what you do, sort of thing. Yeah, of course, yeah. Married, two kids, uh, Black Labrador, love football, big Chelsea fan, love music, live concerts, and love business. Absolutely love business. And um, tell us about Riverview Law and the work that you do over there, because you are probably a, a law firm with a difference, I would suggest. Uh, well, I, I, I think all we've done is built a legal organisation that starts from the customer up rather than the partner down. Um, all our work and research before we set up Riverview Law uh, showed that customers don't mind how their problem is solved, whether that's a combination of technology, customer service people, paralegals, legal executives, junior solicitors, senior solicitors, QCs, junior barristers. They just want their problem solved. They want it solved at the right time. They want the right team to do it. And preferably, they want it with client experience, fixed prices, and transparency. Right. Uh, and that's what we do. So we've just built a model from the customer. We've done nothing clever. Well, some some people would say that that's quite that that well. It's it might not be clever, but it's um it's it's smart. Let's say. Um, uh, well, I hope so. C customers seem to be voting with their feet, so um, yeah, at the moment it seems to be the right thing to have done. So excellent. So I mean, here on the blog, I love to talk about and share ideas, strategies, and stories about companies that are trying to be a bit more sort of customer focused and a bit more sort of centric, customer centric in, the, in how they approach growth. Yeah. Do you think that, do you see that there are signs that the power of the customer is rising? I mean, and, and it, or is it just there's something else kind of going on? What, what what's the things you think that are, that's driving the market? I mean, is it, are, we, are we getting better or worse at service or are we, get, are we just demanding more as customers? What, what's your view on that? Well, if I, if I comment on the legal market, yes, uh, there is no doubt that customers will be massive drivers of change. Uh, because if you look at the way legal services have been delivered in the past, mm -hmm. they've had very few options in terms of the way in which uh, they could buy services. Mm -hmm. uh, so one of the big drivers for us is our objective is to change the way businesses use, measure and buy legal services. And part of that is by giving them fixed pricing. And if you look at what's happened in the marketplace historically, it's largely been built around the hourly billing model. Yes, of course. And that hourly billing model, and that's not been very customer-centric. It's been very partner-centric, very law firm-centric. Yes. But from a customer's perspective, that's hard, hardly ideal. So I think in the legal market, you'll see several things happen, one of which will be that customers will drive change uh -huh. without any shadow of doubt because alternatives will be provided. Yes. <laughs> and what's happened historically is they've not had alternatives. So if those alternatives arise, and you see more people like us enter the marketplace and give those alternative pricing models and service experience and technology and people mm -hmm. combined in a complete solution, I think the trend and the customer trend will just be quick. They will drive change faster than I think most law firms anticipate. And do you think those things are that, uh, particularly in the legal sector, do you think that's being accentuated by one, the, um, the environment that we've found ourselves in for the last four years now, and two, the recent new legislation, which is the, about the AS and the ABSs that came into place in um, January, I think it was? I think you're right. There's a combination of things in play, uh, and that ranges from the economy at one end, mm -hmm. because clearly uh, things are difficult. People are looking at their costs uh, in organisations, whether they're small, medium or large. Yes. Legal bills can be a big cost, so no, no, no surprise there that they're focusing on them. So the economy is clearly having an impact. Mm -hmm. I think at the other end of it, uh, you're seeing people wanting better service. I mean, if you think about the way in which we're all buying services um, using technology, whether it's been online banking, whether it's been the drive to customer experiences, the legal market's been protected historically yes. by regulation, by myths, uh, by being put on a pedestal. A lot of the work that can be done um, in the legal market doesn't need to be done by lawyers, yet it's still being charged at legal practice. Yes. So I think you're going to see, you're seeing the economy at one end, I think you're seeing regulation acting as a signpost for change, and I think you've seen customers realising that, hold on, there are alternatives. So I think there's a combination of factors. Excellent. And so, I mean, this is, as you say, this, this affects all businesses of all sorts of different sort of sizes, and, and, and Absolutely. you are, particularly in the legal sector, it seems to me that Riverview Law, you are leading the charge um, on, on this, but say you were um, 
in the legal industry is not so dissimilar to other, say, professional services um, right. areas. I mean, so if you were a partner of a professional service firm and you're listening to this or reading this this blog and you're thinking, I know I need to sort of get my hands around this and 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 get stuck into it, what would you what would you be suggesting that businesses do, particularly if in that professional services market, to to push themselves on to make that change to kind of to try and get better, as it were? Where should they be starting? Uh, well. Uh, well, fundamentally, they've got to start with the key question, what business are we actually in? Right. And they've got to understand the answer to that question. What is it that customers value? Mm -hmm. What are they prepared to pay for? Mm -hmm. How do you organize yourselves to deliver the services customers want? Mm -hmm. uh, and it's quite interesting. You know, a lot of the debate that we've had prior to the launch of review law and since is when we're engaging with lawyers, um, there's a big focus on the quality of the technical advice, but that's only part of the overall service. It's only part of the quality experience. Sure. Clearly, you've got to have high quality, accurate technical advice, but it's a reality. If I'm on the other side of it as a customer, you can be the best legal uh, opinion expert in the world. If I can't understand what you're saying to me and I can't act upon it, it's not worth very much. So I think what's interesting is you've got to start from a position of what business are we in, how do we organize ourselves to actually deliver what customers want and what they're prepared to pay for? Sure. And what do we do in terms of restructuring our operations so we've got a proper combination of people and technology? Because technology is going to be very key in this, but the key always is the people. So sure. however good technology is, it doesn't change them. You know, people interaction is fundamental to the whole process. Yeah, so I mean, and on the technology side, I mean, is I always, um, what I find quite interesting with, uh, with all of this and with companies going down this not necessarily reinventing themselves in the journey, but actually becoming a bit, a bit more customer focused. Is many companies fall into that trap where they? It's when you talk about technology and people, um, it's there becomes a bit of a cart before the horse type thing because they end up starting with the technology before they they start, they start with the people. Absolutely, and it's about culture and behaviours. And you know, the great thing is, however good technology is. In business services, that includes the legal market, yeah. you can't remove the need for human interaction. What the technology does, though, is change the nature and frequency of the interaction, yes. i.e. that it's at the right moment, at the most value, and it actually enhances the client experience. So you're right, it, 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 is, it is cut before horse. Technology is fundamental, but it's a means to an end. The people, they make the difference. And that's and that's one of the biggest, you know, the, the you know the biggest challenges. I mean, that whole culture and behavioural sort of change and and I think that's one of the things that people underestimate that sort of thing at their, you know, at their peril, uh, I think, because it does take, well, you either got to recruit a whole new set of people, the whole new set of values and behaviours, or you've got to have, you know, the understanding that, that sometimes change takes a while to happen. Absolutely. Or you have the advantage that people like us have is that we started with a blank piece of paper. So you started uh, from, course, the, from the ground up. Well, as a new entrant into the marketplace, we had the luxury of no legacy technology systems, right. no cultural baggage, no people, no stress. So we can actually start from a position which says, what does the customer want? How do we now organize ourselves to deliver it? What type of people do we need? Yeah. What type of behaviors do they need to display? And actually, you're right about technology only being a means to them because I think it's, it, when we have in the past in our other businesses looked at transformation projects or assisting clients when we've been doing things, Part of the key thing is being helping them to understand these are not technology projects. Yes. They're services projects. If yes. you start it as a technology project, you've got the tail wagging the dog. Yes, indeed. And so if you were um, a, are already an established player in, in, in the professional service, business services market and you had a lot of legacy systems and, and people and infrastructure, offices, etc., etc., in place, do you think that rather than trying to, if you like, transform this one big sort of entity, do you think it might be better to actually do it in a way that you almost create a new division and then pilot something that you can learn from that helps well, you sort I, of I, transform? I'm just, I'm just, I'm like sort of exploring about the, the whole change a, side of things. It's a, it's a, it's a really good thought. I, I think the, the global answer to your question is there's no silver bullet. There's no one answer. Yes. For every organization. Every organization is at a different stage of its evolution and development, mm -hmm. and therefore a different solution is required for it. But of course, you've seen and we've seen in other industries, in other sectors, where people have recognized, hold on a second, we've got this fantastic business, 
This business has served us well over however many years. It's still got growth within it. Maybe mm-hmm. we're going to have to amend and flex it going forward. Mm-hmm. But there is a reality. We've got this market change occurring over here, which if we're not careful, it's going to make us redundant in yes. this core activity. So what do we do? Right, we redefine where our core business is and where it goes, and maybe that means it goes further up the value curve. Uh-huh. Maybe it becomes more special and focused. And to the side, side of it, we create a skunk works. You've just effectively described yes. the creation of a skunk works, which means let's create a new activity outside, not constrained by the decision-making, the capital structure, the people, the technology we've got in the core business, and let's give it the freedom to run. Now, the big issue that arises in that scenario is it's too easy for the parent company to interfere. Well, I know that having worked in a corporate environment and and worked in in a couple of skunk works within a corporate environment, it is really hard. And you can see why we structured what we've done in the way we structured it. So if you look at Riverview Law, um, amongst its shareholders are as minority shareholders, DLA Piper um, and Advisor Plus Business Solutions. Right. Uh, because both those businesses are fantastic businesses, growing significantly, good market positions. But if you want to attack a changing market in a different way, you do it outside of those operations. So they are minority shareholders in the business. They were influential in the setting up of it, but they're yep. not involved in the management of it, the running of it, the technology, anything. But they know they need to have a stake in the future. But they've got a stake in the future. Now, you know, it's for us to prove that that was a wise thing for them to do. Um, but, you know, early signs are encouraging. But at least they're placing bets, and that's encouraging as well. Well, I have to say, I think, you know, to the credit of um, a DLA Piper and Advisor Plus, uh, they, are, they, they had that classic, what's our strategy, what business are we in, where do we see the growth, how do we exploit it, how do we organise ourselves to do it, and sometimes you don't do it within your own activity. Sure. So, um, Carl, in the interest of time, I just got another couple of questions. I mean, that's right, that's right. in this day and age, it's like there's so, there's so much stuff that's getting sort of written and read and put out there, particularly you know along sort of social media channels and things. Absolutely. Um, and it feels like we're um, we're having to drink from the hose pipe many you know, many times. And it's um, how do you how do you where do you get your information from? Where and how do you keep up when keep yourself sort of stimulated new ideas and and things? Um, or do you or do you not and and turn things off and and and, and confine yourself to your own thoughts? Uh, well, it, it's ironically it's a combination of both. I think one of the biggest things for all of us is finding the space to think. Yeah, and that's quite hard for the yes. reason you described. Uh, but you do need to find that space. But to be able to think, you've also got to be open to a lot of new ideas and thoughts and what's actually happening out there. So how do we do it? Of course, on an individual basis, uh, social media has become an increasingly important channel over the last six, nine, 12 months. Yes. And, you, know, you look at the stuff that's going on there in terms of uh, the legal Twitter stuff is amazing. The blogs out there from people like Stephen Allen and Tom Kilroy. Uh-huh. Uh, and, and, but there's loads of stuff going on there which are fantastic. Um, and that's really good in terms of thoughts, but it goes beyond that. Clearly, you, you know, you, the key to it is meeting people. Yes. I mean, the amount you learn from sitting across a table from a general counsel, from competitors in the marketplace, whether that's existing law firms or others, whether it's suppliers into that market, you know, who supply technology and other services. Getting out and meet, meeting and speaking to people is probably the single biggest thing. Business development, which is one of my key roles, yeah. uh, obviously, as CEO, that's one of the key things to do. Spending time with customers is absolutely invaluable. The other key thing, though, is I've got some fantastic colleagues within the business, uh, some who are solely fo- focused on social media. Right. Uh, and they, they, they know the sorts of things we're going to be interested in, and you know, they provide things, and they're a great sift, because actually you can get swamped. They give me a great sift. Uh, our, our colleague in the U.S. in New York um, is fascinating getting that international perspective as well about what's happening out there and how that's going. So he's a very good feed of um, information about change and trends. And by the way, the English legal system, we have got a massive global opportunity given the decisions that the U.S. have made about not allowing non-lawyer involvement. And that's a fantastic opportunity for us in the U.K., phenomenal opportunity. Excellent. Um, so there's, lot, there's lots of different feeds, lots of different feeds. I mean, I have to say... Um, a lot of it is to do with sitting down across the table and speaking to people. I think that's a really great point, and it's actually one that um, it's funny. The um, I was at a meeting yesterday with a bunch of people, and that came across um, very clearly. In that, you know, the digital world is fine, but we are people, and exactly. 
you know, and when we when we we sit down in front of each other, well, whether we speak on the phone or we do it over a video conference or we sit down face to face, which is almost the you know the ultimate, is we like that personal side of things because that's who we are as people. And but I'll tell you what, I'll tell you what's interesting in that though, you know, and that's absolutely spot on. But there are some people who I would not have been able to meet unless I had a Twitter account and engaged in the conversations that took place there. So there are relationships where. I'm sure people, if I'd approached them in the normal way, either through trying to ring through to their office and getting their gatekeeper writing to them, uh, unless I'd bumped into them at a conference or something like that, I would never have got through their door. So the irony about the social media world is it does actually allow you to open some doors you could not get through to normally. Oh, I think that's abs- that's absolutely fair, and and it's it's happened to you know uh, to me particularly when the. Um, with the blogging and the interviewing and things, I mean, I primarily use it as a um, as a sort of a learning and networking tool, effectively. Phenomenal. I, I have to say, when I read you, when I read your blogs and saw what you're doing, I thought, what a, what a cracking business model because it opens doors for you in a way which you wouldn't get through. I think it's fantastic. <laughs> so thank you. When I do these interviews, thank you, Carl, for sharing all these in, uh, your insights and things. But one of the things I always like to, the one question I like to ask on the end of the, uh, the interview is. What would you like to shamelessly plug? Oh, uh, without any shout out, Riverview Law. I mean, Riverview Law provides fixed price, legal advice and guidance to organisations of all sizes. Uh, and I've got absolutely no doubt from all the meetings we've had with general counsel, mid caps and small companies, when we explain to them and show them what we're doing, the traction is incredible. The conversion from them listening and speaking and meeting the people and actually buying the service is huge. So Riverview Law, without any shadow of doubt, we are going to help change the way businesses use, buy and measure legal services. That's fantastic. That sounds like, that sounds like a huge rallying call, Carl. Well, I think it's a rallying call. There's, I tell you, the opportunity in the legal market for existing law firms and for new entrants is huge. It's a huge marketplace which hasn't been subjected to the normal competitive pressures you and I have seen in other markets. Yes, indeed. It's been protected by regulation. So the opportunity to, to, to really build some massive businesses even in a period of difficult economic circumstances, it's there. And you build big businesses in recession. Yeah, I think that's absolutely fair. That's absolutely fair. Carl, thank you for that. that that's, um, that's brilliant. I mean, I think you've, uh, you've, you've told us, you know, shared a few insights, but also, um, also told us about a huge opportunity that's out there for uh, people that are willing to, you know, to, to grab hold of it. Absolutely. So, so thank you for that. No problem at all.